chaos. <laughs> a bit tight. Right, well, thank you very much for the kind invite. I have spoken um, to a group of you some years ago. I think it was at the United Reformed Church in Hull at that time. Uh, and I've been look, fortunate enough over the last few years to gather more photographs and digitise them so uh, we can see what happens with our water supply and how the River Dee's been developed over, over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, a nice pick of the uh, site in Borton, where our Chester water supply comes from. And you can see there a cloudy scene with the tower emerging from it. The water tower in Borton is actually used or was used by Liverpool uh, pilots flying in as one of their guiding things on their last flight path. So uh, it's also used for, for other things. Nowadays, sadly, uh, no water in the top of it but uh, I'll talk about that a bit, little bit later on. The River Dee, massively important. Two and a half million people's water supply in uh, the northwest of England and North Wales. The principal reservoirs you can see there, uh, Bala, the original. Kellin, we've talked about the politicization of water. The Alwyn supply and Brennig all feeding in. And then keeping that river maintained and it's altered, it's got an artificial flow to it now. It doesn't naturally spate and, and, and uh, very low t rivers. It's kept at a fairly constant level by the Environment Agency or, or Natural Resources Wales, who make sure there's a minimum amount flows over Chester Weir each day uh, to protect the water, the water supply, water quality, which, uh, as, we, as we know these days, is, is, is under threat. Uh, one two, three, four, five, six are principal of attractions where water supply is taken out. Number six is, is at Bangor on Dee for the main part of the Wrexham area. Five is uh, a North Wales Buckley mould supply. Four is the biggest abstraction from the river and in the summer a quarter of the river flow can disappear at number four to Liverpool by the uh, works at Huntington. Number three is another Northwest supply that's taken out, uh, United Utilities. Two is your supply. On the Earl's Eye, as, as you walk along the meadows, there's a little mound there, and underneath that mound is the, is the intake. And one is an industrial supply uh, that United Utilities can use for untreated water for cooling purposes in, in Merseyside, uh, Ellesmere Port. And that's the extent of the people, two and a half million people in the green uh, shaded areas there that rely on the River Dee for a good clean drinking water supply. There's many books about the Dee. Uh, mine is yet to come, but hopefully it'll be here in the next five years. Uh, <clears throat> you can see there quite a few good ones, uh, one or two recent ones. And, and Water, the book, is an excellent one, an, a tome for anybody who wants to study water supply as a history. Uh, for the UK. Bala, the principal lake, as we know, feeds in, into the River Dee, and uh, the sluice gates that control the water flowing in, into the main river itself by Natural Resources Wales. Picture the old sluice gates there that can control that flow and make sure that they're not releasing too much to cause flooding and they're not letting too little down so that the abstraction places uh, intakes are protected and have enough water to take out all year round. Uh, the Alwyn Reservoir, uh, stone masonry dam built across uh, a rocky gorge, so it's easy enough to tie the uh, stonework in, into the embankments. Uh, it's actually used, it's one of the um, few uses where the water supply is direct from the Alwyn Dam as, as well as supplementing the River Dee flow. Uh, by, via Welsh Water. Welsh Water, by the way, is a not-for-profit water company uh, operating in, in the UK. And they take care of the sewage side of uh, things in, in Chester. Uh, again, I'll explain later on why that peculiar system is. There's one water company providing the clean water, which is now Seven Trent, who bought Dee Valley Water, who bought uh, Chester Waterworks, who obtained the City of Chester Waterworks Company as it developed in 1600. 
There you can see uh, the uh, cannon supply and the draw, draw off tower. Uh, water standing in a body uh, such as a large reservoir there. Uh, sunlight can obviously affect it, ice uh, development and that. And the water quality can change under certain depths of the water. Uh, a very hot summer, uh, any pollution or minerals and that going into it, you can get a big algal growth. And this can overbalance different layers and different densities in the, in the uh, reservoir. And the whole thing can turn over. The water supply in the reservoir turns over due to density difference in, in the water and stirs up all the bottom, all the nasty bits that have sunk, the organic material. And you can get quite an obnoxious taste and problems. So water can be drawn from different depths in a tower to keep that uh, balance right and, and those different layers, of, uh, temperature layers within the reservoir. This is what it looks like when it's empty. Uh, it refills in a single winter uh, with heavy rains and snowfall. Uh, Kellyn, so it's an important uh, reservoir for the River Dee because it maintains for the next year the supply. And it's simply because of the topography. It's built in a valley uh, with a sharp runoff. So rain, snow melt, etc., will run into the valley, into the reservoir, and top it back up. And again, you can see there what it looks like, a tremendous body of water there. At the bottom of the uh, Kellin Reservoir is a hydroelectric power station that Welsh Water constructed. Uh, when first built, it was about 7.5 megawatts, so enough to power a, um, a decent-sized village. Uh, and again, very simple technology in that. It is used throughout the UK, but not as much as it could be or should be. The River Dee is important, uh, not just for drinking water, it's used for leisure purposes, uh, World Water, White Water Canoeing Championships. A lot of people canoe and use the river for leisure purposes. So Natural Resources Wales have to take all this under consideration and uh, keep the river, it's not solely just for the water abstractors to use, but for a wide variety of people. Migratory fish coming back up, so the levels and cleanliness of it is important. It was an important uh, game fishery for, for many years and an important in, in Chester and Hambridge for the salmon fishermen. The other reservoir, and believe it or not, all the years I've been giving this talk, its name's just vanished <laughs> from my head to come across it in a minute. This one was built and opened by um, Prince Charles around about 1975. Um, very large reservoir, reservoir uh, wide uh, surface area it can take about three and a half years to refill once emptied. So if it's, it's drawn down by Natural Resources Wales uh, to supplement the D, it, it could be a three and a half to five year refill depending on the, on the weather and climate change is obviously changing itself as well. There is a visitor centre there uh, with some nice archaeological walks and, and plans around it. Uh, no, sorry, it's. Brennig. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> yeah, so, so Brennig Reservoir. There is a nice visitor centre there as well, and some nice walks around it. And this is the, uh, the turn of the uh, 20th century, uh, or late 19th century, Langothlin. There's the River Dee. As you can see, more of a morass than a, than a river. Uh, and down here, soil pipes coming from the houses, dropping their raw sewage straight into the river. And by the uh, end of the 19th century, even up to the 1930s, the river was a big problem. The waterworks at that time, Chester Waterworks Company, had a big battle on taking on all these councils and, and actions against them to try and improve things. And it was around about the 30s, the uh, medical officers of health and the health bodies and that started to get going properly and start taking actions against uh, scenes like this. And you can imagine there, there's hardly any water for any fish to survive and that. Bangor on Dee, <clears throat> a nice tranquil summer's day. Uh, the church, the bridge over it, the river coming around that way, flowing around. It's a, quite an important site as regards uh, British history goes, because just for once the Welsh and English fought on the same side against the invading Northumbrians back in the 9th century. Uh, the monastery and that was there, the priory. They prayed for the English and Welsh to win. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, 
they lost, and uh, the inhabitants of the uh, monastery were all put to the sword for praying for the wrong side. And there has been some archaeological remains and that found along on that stretch, but it's an area that's still worthy of more uh, research. This is what happens if we can't contain all the water in those reservoirs. A massive floodplain at Bangor. There's a, today, these days, there's a warning system for people to evacuate and, and get to safe, um, safe areas like schools on higher ground and uh, people can move to. And again, Bangor on the High Street, children going to school, Bangor on that street, people going to the post office by the boat. So you see there, this is the extent of flooding and, and we know much worse can happen. Uh, but again, it, it is a problem if this reoccurs in areas and I still cannot understand the life of me to why planning inspectors can overturn local councils and we end up as we are today, building on floodplains in the Chester area and throughout the UK. And this is the uh, meanders between Bangor and Farndon. You can see there for the budding geography students, a long-term formation of an oxbow lake coming when it eventually cuts across the harder ground. But they're meandering. When uh, Chester's swan population disappeared uh, in the 60s, 70s from the groves, they were basically all up here hiding somewhere quieter. There was lots of blame on, on lead shot at the time. And, and there were legitimate reasons for, for lead shot being blamed for swan deaths uh, because when they're foraging down and people's fishing weights had disappeared. So nowadays, uh, the, there's non-toxic uh, shot for fishermen to use. So things have improved and gone on over the years. We can see there, nice fertile land, uh, nice loam and, and sandy loam off the river been deposited over the years in that area. But again, good growing grassland, uh, used to be mainly dairy farming and that. But this has changed over the years. Again, another shot where you can see greater meanders uh, around the place from, from a high, higher shot up on the plain. Nowadays, predominantly, you see rapeseed growing and, and things like that in, in, in the uh, area. Dairy farming has much reduced, uh, as we know. <coughs> Farndon, again, uh, a lot of flooding there and problems. The, uh, what was then the Welsh Environment Agency have channeled the river just a bit further upstream from this to try and reduce this flooding impact on Farndon and Holt. The Iron Bridge, uh, the water industry always uses bridges for sampling points because you get a good representative sample of the water quality dangling your tube uh, and uh, container off the top of the bridge in the middle flow. So uh, we used to take samples at the Iron Bridge, but now uh, we've got on built um, all the abstractors on the River Dee, United Utilities, Welsh Water, and now Seven Trent as the old Chester Waterworks company. There are um, on-site laboratories built on the banks of the Dee to monitor for the regular pollutants that uh, all the factories and industry and farming can, can hold, um, and, and wideband things. Uh, so they're running 24-7. Uh, there's a sample trip goes twice a day just to get a wet sample as well out of the river, just to make sure in between everything's looking good to protect your water supply itself. The river coming along, flowing towards us. Uh, this is the head, was the head gamekeeper's cottage on the Eaton Estate. If you notice that little mark on the wall, flood water level, February the 9th, 1946. Very bad winter, 1945, early 46. Huge snow melt, obviously melts quick. And then the river came up at record, record levels to actually go that far up over my head on, on, on the top of the building and it's going to rise a couple of metres out to come over the bank as well. So a huge surge on, on, on the River Dee. Uh, probably the worst in memory for that one. 1950s, uh, Chester Waterworks, when they had their intake originally just a little bit further up than from the Earl's Eye, uh, further along the footpath along the river itself, they... Uh, they, had bought a few, they actually owned some of the land upstream and downstream of the intake itself, both banks, to protect it, to avoid uh, any, anything developing or b uh, building or anything being stored there uh, above the intake itself. 
But in the 1950s, Liverpool Corporation took Chester Waterworks to court and managed to uh, compulsory purchase some of the Chester Waterworks land to build their own waterworks for take water out of the River Dee for Liverpool. So all these geopolitical fights that go on all over the world, yeah, it happened in Chester as well. So Liverpool Corporation built their uh, large waterworks, one, one of the largest in the UK. Uh, and in a hot, uh, typical hot summer of the, uh, of the day, big abstraction, big demand for water, then they're taking out about a quarter of the river flow at that point under their license. So huge volumes going in there. The volume of water going into the intake is that much. They have to have a, a fish scarer to make sure they don't pull too many of the native fish into the, uh, into the intake screens and that as well. Nowadays, I think since 2015, regulations mean that you have to put uh, special screens in front of your intakes to protect elvers. So when the eels now are spawning, uh, they don't get drawn in either. And it can be a bubble curtain, mesh screens and all sorts to uh, discourage the fish from, from being uh, pulled, pulled in by, by the current going in, into these places. And that's all, all over the country. Probably one of the last EU rules we've uh, implemented. Coming towards Chester now, coming round, nice straight. Uh, Chester Waterworks originally, uh, uh, well, in Seven Trent now, it's not all the Duke's land or actually uh, Chester Corporate or Chester West and Chester, uh, Cheshire West and Chester who own the meadows for the public good. Uh, this part was donated by the Browns family um, who own the Debenham store in Chester. This actual portion here, uh, I don't even know if they own it since they bought the uh, company, but uh, and this area is still owned by uh, now Seven Trent to protect the, uh, the intake was originally there for Chester Waterworks. They had two large pipelines from there going across to the, where the mound is now uh, into a well and then gravitating across the river to Barrowell Hill pumping station. Um, the reason the intake was there originally is at this point in Huntington, Coldy Brook comes into the river and uh, at that time, there was enough flow from Coldy Brook coming in to stop saline water from the tide passing there. There was enough dilution. Even though the river flow can reverse, the brackish water coming up was sort of contained by that influx coming from Coldy Brook. Uh, but unfortunately, over time, by the, about the uh, 1960s, the two pipelines under the D had silted up, under the field had silted up. So... Uh, they had to build a new intake in 1963 on the meadows at Earl's Eye uh, and to gravitate across in, into Barrowell pumping station to pump it up into the Borton treatment works just there. Uh, United Utilities, Liverpool Corporation, uh, still own all this bit. The works is just below this picture here. Uh, they have uh, with their sludge, they take out the water, the sand, silts and that. They're dumped on uh, this ground here. They've got some drying beds there, sludge lagoons. Uh, that encouraged some uh, reeds and things to grow on there so much that they attracted rare wading birds. So it, had to, it got uh, nominated as a site of biological importance for the D area. So, uh, so there today, that, that's fairly grown uh, rush beds and things on there and uh, a, a benefit to the area. But of course, people can walk all this way, and I think the footpath, obviously, all the way around to Eccleston. I was having a boat ride many years ago off, off the, uh, the uh, what was Biffle Boats at the time, I think Chester Boat Company now. Coming up here, the um, guy giving the talk was quite proudly displaying quite a good knowledge of the River Dee, and he said, this is known as the Windmill Strait, because as the rowers are coming up, they're giving them signals to either go faster than that and waving hair. But there was, in fact, I, I, was, I quietly told him afterwards, there was actually a wind pump there that looked like a little windmill. <laughs> and that's probably why it was called Windmill Strait. And that's what it was. <laughs> uh, Meadow Farm Huntington, to abstract water for, for irrigation and um, watering crops or whatever. It, I'm not, I can't confirm whether it was water supply or not at that time, but Meadow Farm Huntington, there was a, a little uh, wind pump there just to raise water from there and, and, and pump to wherever in his system. 
Chester Waterworks as it was at the time, uh, became City of Chester Waterworks in 1600, one of the oldest water companies, private water companies, I dare say, in, in, uh, in the country. Um, for those who could afford and, and uh, purchase a water supply, mostly the ecclesiastical authorities, sorry, <laughs> became Chester Waterworks, uh, round about, uh, uh, resurrected as Chester Waterworks in, in the 19th century. Uh, 1997, we were taken over by the Wrexham company who had strategically named themselves D Valley Water, so we did suspect a takeover was going to come. And then the last recent purchase was by Seven Trent, who bought Dee Valley Water out. And you can see there, as it was, the water supply area for Dee Valley was, was basically the, based on the, the Chester and Wrexham areas, the population. And at last were there the Romans. When Vespasian and Titus were consuls of Rome and uh, Julius Agricola was governor of Britain, they had a plumbing system or a water pipe system in AD 79 in Chester. So 20, 30 years or so after the invasion, the second invasion, they already had a pipe water supply coming into the city. And this came, uh, I'll go back one. This came probably from springs in Borton, very close to the site um, of where the current waterworks is today. So almost a 2,000 year history there in, in Borton itself. We know that because the Romans asked for divine protection of their water supply, and uh, there was a very nice water fountain uh, that you can see when the Duke of Westminster opens his estate for his a couple of times a year. It's in a nice caged uh, receptacle there, protected, so dedicated to the nymphs and, and genius of the springs. And this was located by workmen in, in Randbuck Cherry Road in the 19th century. A uh, very nice example uh, of this, and it was promptly pinched by the Duke of Westminster at the time, or his agent, to look as a nice garden ornament, and uh, in Eaton Hall it went. The Romans were very clever, obviously, we know they were great water engineers. They recognised that silver had a, had a uh, property that uh, was capable of reducing, they didn't know about bacteria, but they, they knew it kept the water clean and, and safe. Uh, how many of you know today that the mattress you lie on has got silver particles in it to stop sweat and that developing bacteria within the fibres? Same with water filters, little jug filters. The carbon, carbon's a funny product. It's great for treating water, but the funny thing about it is any part, fine particles in it, water bacteria can grow. So they put little silver, silver particles in, in that carbon as well to stop water bacteria developing. But the Romans understood by whatever means this, I just find the history of water supply fascinating. So yeah, plan of the city of Chester. The Rue D there you can see, bought and treatment works, uh, the old mains, and then the new one developed in 63. And this was the uh, site of the Roman pipeline that fed to a Castellum Aqua or stone water tank within the walls uh, from the springs in Borton. Um, even today, if you walk down Badawell Hill, uh, you can see a little spring coming out the sandstone and out the brickwork and flowing down a little channel and then disappears under one of the houses where there's a nice sandstone trough cut in their foundations and it flows out into the river and uh, trickles into the river when it's flowing. So yeah, fantastic history and, and that. Um, other water supply areas, the Abbot's Well in Christleton, as it was known, in the 13th century, there was a, um, they were allowed to lay earthenware pipes from that area to, uh, from Christleton, again, to one of the friaries in Chester. In 1537, a doctor wall was given a, a license to uh, build conduit to Borton to uh, go through the city walls and uh, supply at the bridge gate. Uh, in 1582, that license was altered to include a supply for the public at the High Cross. And then 1600, uh, a water supply was taken direct from the River Dee, raised by a water wheel up into a tower. Uh, there were two towers on, on the, uh, the old Dee Bridge, an earlier one and then a, a, a nice octagonal one there. And then it was lifted by the water wheel up into the top of the tower, and from the tank at the top, it just gravitated down to uh, 
and public water supply at the cross. Again, there was a license granted, but I haven't found any evidence yet for a waterworks actually in Spittle Walk, where, Spittle Walk, where um, the works is today. And then 1692, a new tower. And then 1826, the Chester Waterworks Company was, uh, had statutory powers given it by government and built the intake at Barrowell Hill itself. And again, lots more acts coming after that, giving them more powers. And uh, I think that was a direct supply in the intake at that time. Wooden water mains have their place. Uh, they still pop up, or have popped up around Chester. There's certainly plenty around London that, that Thames water dig up. But uh, generally used to use elm because it was a uh, workable wood. But when it was water contained in it, it absorbed the water. And actually the joints where the, the wooden pipes were uh, connected together uh, became watertight as the, as the wood swelled and tightened up. And there you can see this one uh, is at Chester Waterworks in Borton, uh, the Waterworks site in Borton. And they're wooden pieces, metal collars. And for those who could afford it at the time, a little nice big lump of lead pipe coming off, taking the supply into the kitchen or housing area. That one's around about uh, a good 12 inch diameter. Um, this was the other way people got the water supply. Um, in Chester, they considered themselves that important. They petitioned the Crown to be known as the ancient and worshipful guild of the drawers of the Dee. So they filled these large bar barrels down in, uh, at the river and then carted them up to, uh, to sell the water around Chester. Probably got regular customers and that as well. The octagonal tower you can see, on, uh, as it was on, on the bridge gate, uh, Tyra's water tower, erected around about 1600. Though there are, is some uh, conflicting dates because there was an earlier tower as well. But uh, I think 1721 is the date, or, or must be a bit later. 1721, it was uh, it was demolished. Fearsome looking contraption, but this was a, a typical water wheel at the time, uh, a patent invention where paddles going around scoop the water up into a trough and then uh, piston pumps just lifting that water up into the top of a tower where it could just flow by gravity then for, for people to use in a tank anywhere about in, in town. We believe it was, this was an engine uh, contraption on, on the Thames, but we believe it was a, a, the same person, this Dr. Wall, who uh, probably had something very similar on, on the, on the D at Chester. Again, a close-up, uh, or of a slightly different type, uh, paddle wheel and, and pistons pumping the water up. Back down at Borton at Barrowell Hill, uh, you can see here the tall uh, pump house as it was then, simply because it was resembled, uh, it was a Cornish tin, tin engineer who was brought in to revise the uh, supply to Chester, the failing supply. So it was a beam engine inside, nice beam engine there, raising water up into the works at Borton, where there was a corresponding beam engine inside the blue water tower you see today, pumping water out into, uh, into the city itself. The nice uh, octagonal, it's still known as Chimney Gardens today, by the way, over the Manweb substation just round the back uh, near the mount. Uh, there was, in fact, only ever one chimney. The artist added the second one for just a bit of artistic license, to, <laughs> just, just to try and balance the picture a little bit, rather than it being a, at all. Yeah, there was a, um, this was originally, I think, an oil, an, a small oil painting that uh, Chester Waterworks had in its possession and then went to De uh, Wrexham. I do have a, an etching engraving equivalent of it. And again, even, even in the, uh, getting towards the 50s and 60s, the uh, lovely building there uh, was still about. And the beam engine inside was re resembled this one that I took a photograph of from Edinburgh Museum. Uh, you can see there the wheel turning round, nodding beam that nods back and forwards. And again, a piston to ram that uh, water down a narrower pipe and lift it to wherever it needs to go. Because water companies at the time were statutory. They, could, uh, they didn't need planning permission for things. So sadly, buildings like this have mostly disappeared.
because of course if they don't need planning permission to build, they don't need permission to demolish. So sadly a lot of these have got but even some of the, some of the uh, tower and the engine house at uh, Chester has still got lovely, um, lovely brickwork and things inside. By the 18, towards the 1850s, cholera was rife. That pollution we saw at Lang Langoflin and all the way down, Holt, Farndon, Privies running straight into the ditch, straight into the river. And it took quite a while to realize this, th this was waterborne. The, the, the germs were there in the water. So cholera and typhoid, lots of people were catching. Up until the 1880s, some of the water entering Chester city centre might have been untreated, raw water supply. There were reports in 1886 in, in, the, in the Chester Courant, for those of you who can remember that, a little publication. Uh, elvers and eels, small eels coming through people's taps <laughs> to their sink. Uh, so we know it was untreated or, or somehow circumnavigating the treatment process. But down at Barrowell Hill, uh, again, one of these clever engineers at the time, the Victorians, we, we owe our wonderful sewer system that the water companies are still relying on from Victorian times for, for, to carry our sewage away, uh, brought in. And one idea was let natural filtration through the rock under the river bed. Uh, filter the water, let it filter through the sandstone and into tunnels and then fill the intake from that, which was a cracking idea. So they brought, the, again, the Cornish tin miners were experts working underground in very bad wet conditions. So Barrowell Hill, one of the big wells that we use as, as, uh, today to suck the water out of, that was actually sunk as a deep shaft. And then at various depths and, and lengths, there's tunnels running under the sandstone in, in the River Dee. And uh, the idea was to filter through the rock. And we know sandstone is porous. The trouble was under that part of the River Dee, it wasn't so porous, it was too hard, so you didn't get any water in the tunnels. And the other parts, it was very porous and the tunnels collapsed. So it was an excellent idea and scheme, but unfortunately didn't work. So abandoned in, in 1851. Fortunately, we were left with a drawing of that scheme that, that, so we know it, it, it actually took place and the origins of one of the suction wells today. For those of you who have got a jug filter, because I spent many years telling the people of Chester uh, as the water treatment manager, you don't need a jug filter, you don't need a filter at all. In the 19th century, they actually had the bigger version on the side of the sink where the old hand pump could pump into it. And uh, this one itself is actually called the D-Filter Company patent. Uh, higher income household, probably filled with a, an inert sand or, or, or even carbon at that time was being recognized as a superb material for filtering uh, things out of water, chemicals and that as well. And uh, yeah, just poured over, filtered through a media and then dribbled out at the end for, for a cleaner water supply. So it would have got rid of sands and silts and, and probably some, it certainly would have got rid of taste if carbon was used. Onto the Earl's Eye, uh, you can see there the mound, uh, the intake itself. Uh, again, say a popular walking spot. Uh, constructed mostly underground, simply because it's a visual area there. We're not allowed to, we weren't allowed at the time to, to you didn't want to build in there to obstruct the view, particularly with uh, some of the fancy houses along here. <coughs> so constructed in 63, the water comes down the river into the intake, under, into the pipes itself and then gravitate through two clean pipes to Barrowell Hill where it's pumped up to, to Borton itself. The reason, obviously I mentioned it's underground, uh, inside it are two giant sieves. So they're sieving out all leaves and twigs uh, and material litter and things that can be in the river simply because you don't want to start pumping that through pumps because pumps will wear out quicker. Uh, they can snag, they can jam, and, and it's a very expensive process to replace a pump. So all the fines and that taken out, and you can see the leaves and that being washed back into the river <coughs> at that point, because the, the screens are washed by uh, backflow of the, uh, the wash water from the river itself. I had a hard time with the Environment Agency considering I wasn't putting waste back in the river, washing the weaves, leaves back in, because they have taken action against some water companies in the country. But my argument was the leaves are coming down as part of the natural environment. They fall off the trees. 
They're following the river still, albeit into our, our little bit and then dropping back out. And at the time, I was uh, able to fend them off and uh, not have to pay for them to be carted by wagons every day, disappearing off the, off the meadows, which I can imagine friends of the meadows getting my phone number and dialing me all times of the day as the wagons were churning up the, uh, the bank. So a sensible, sensible decision by the uh, environment agency at that time. Uh, there are screens in there to prevent elvers and, and other fine things as well. The reason it's built on the opposite, you might think, why is it, so, why is it built there and the pumping station's there? is because of the natural flow of a river. As it comes around a bend, the outer bend is actually faster flow. So we're hoping the leaves, litter, and other debris get swept round and that way. The only thing that does build up, of course, the heavier stuff, silt and sand uh, and, and clay will start to develop there. So we do have a problem every few years where we have to clean the front of the intake uh, just to get it back down to that level so we can gravitate out the river uh, and uh, get enough water coming, ac coming across. The lady died down as it's going past. Uh, in front of the intake there itself, you can see there we're getting a bit of silt build up because there's a uh, stream of weed growing and that. There is a floating oil boom because unfortunately people use boats, they may top up the fuel, they may, they may spill a little bit onto the river and oil and fuel just spreads a great rainbow iridescence for a long, uh, a long stretch of, of any waterway. Uh, in the bad old days, people used to change their own car oil and tip it down the, the nearest grid. So Caldy Brook and, and things like that would have a bit of oil coming down and, and you used to get these things happen on the river. Nowadays, it's much easier and cheaper to take your car to a garage, get oil changed done properly, and or, or people are much more responsible and intelligent, and obviously don't pour it down the nearest grid in the street, which uh, is probably a storm drain to the nearest watercourse. So yeah, floating oil boom, which is important, about about good metre depth there, so it's to stop the oil wicking round. Uh, Large bar screens to stop the canoeists having a nosy and disappearing as well. And then uh, inside we've got the giant sieves that they're taking out the finer material as well. So a lot of solids being taken out at this point, but that's mainly to protect the pumps uh, and reduce the amount of organic material that could go up to Borton Works. They were so proud of the intake in 1963, uh, built by 1963. Uh, that the grand opening was postponed because the river decided to have a nice flood in 1963 and uh, cut, cut off the intake completely. So luckily, there's uh, electricity supply goes across. In my time, I've seen a second one go in, a backup supply. Um, and of course, there are two pipes coming across the river. The first one uh, was laid in 1886. Uh, they decided one night to collapse on me. Uh, and the chap at work couldn't understand why he wasn't getting any water back up. So when investigating down at Barrowell Hill, we found it was full of silt, uh, the well. Uh, so we were able to change onto the, the other well, which comes via another pipeline, and uh, remedy the situation. Uh, what happened, the, the pipe itself wasn't actually a pipe. It was wrought iron plates. So it was plates all riveted together, over each, overlapping each other like a almost like the back of an armadillo. And of course, one of the rivets had rotted. The hole got bigger and bigger, and the whole piece of cast iron collapsed inside and then sucked all the, uh, because it was on the pump line, it sucked all, all the silt in very quickly. So that was, that was replaced um, around about 2000 or so. Inside the intake itself, this is stainless steel uh, bad screen, with a giant sieve going round and round constantly. The, dirt, uh, the river, as it goes round, you can speed these band screens up. The more leaves, the faster you can go. You can put two on, so there's two giant sieves going round, because the leaves themselves are a big problem. The, all for, the worst scenario the water engineer at Chester can have is a long, gentle winter, a sudden, very hard frost, followed by wind, and every leaf on the bank of the River Dee and the trees all decides to flow in at once. So these all get washed off, but that intake, the uh, chamber rapidly fills full of leaves. So occasionally there is a uh, truck down there and uh, people with forks and shovels and brushes keep trying to get rid of bags and bags of leaves. Painted for the Jubilee, 
uh, Queen's Silver Jubilee at that time, uh, as patriotic Chester Waterworks as was, so red, white, and blue. And then the front, as you can see there, the Roman springs, we think, were in this sandstone outcrop behind and still channeled today as a sandstone trough in that area where it bubbles out of some of these pipes underneath that house uh, at Barrowell Hill. Uh, St. Paul's Church in Borton, and the gallows were just behind there as well. So the name Barrowell Hill itself, there used to be a ferry there, I believe, it's not a public ferry at this point, uh, that ran certainly up to the late the war years, uh, and you could purchase a ride off the uh, attendant from the waterworks across onto, onto the other side of the river, because we obviously had our own landing stage. <coughs> This is one of the wells. Uh, I told you about the suction wells that were originally built to excavate under the River Dig. So, good 10 meters deep uh, with the pipes sucking the water out. Typical maintenance is obviously under breathing apparatus conditions and things. And again, just looking down, not the best picture, but yeah, you, you will still get some deposit, a few leaves and a little bit of silt there to clean out and any fish that may have made it through in the old days would always return because Chester Waterworks had quite a few keen fishermen who were keen to see the stocks go back in the river. You always knew you'd arrived at Chester Waterworks if you got your name on a pump or an engine panel. Uh, so the pumps were all named and the old switch gear there. So nowadays, much more efficient motors, uh, more efficient electric drives and uh, panels and that. So the, the pumps operate on, on the most efficient uh, method possible and tariff possible as well. Because if, if you think about it, water supply, where Chester's lot have lost, lost the, most of its industry. Uh, so the old um, engineering works that were around Newtown and that disappeared, Haywood Williams, aluminium out at Northgate, all those have gone. So it's mostly a flat domestic supply now, but it's a diurnal pattern. It's like a double camel's hump. We have a big hump coming up after uh, around about half seven, eight o'clock, and then a smaller hump for tea time, and then disappearing off. And the time of least flow used to be between three and four in the morning. So if you went out leakage checking at night, the waterworks were out between three and four because they knew as least number of people were using their water at that time. So any strange noises or flows and that could be investigated. Barrowell Hill, as you come down itself, nice ornate brick wall. The springs still dribble out. There's a little channel built behind here where it flows, disappears under this house, and the old ferry there was, was at that time. Uh, the house above the intake is still owned by the water, uh, the pumping station is still owned by the water company for, for obvious reasons. We all know who's living on, on top of a sensitive site. But Barrowell Hill, <clears throat> any guesses on the names? Uh, previously known as the pool in 1600. So there was obviously a water supply there still then. Um, there were springs, there was a well. <clears throat> One of the common books, uh, common themes in the books say rolling suspect witches in a barrel down into the water. If it floats, obviously it's due to witchcraft. So the, uh, the survivor was burnt. If it sinks and pe the person drowns, they couldn't protect themselves from witchcraft. So they obviously they were innocent, but dead. So that's one of the origins. <clears throat> the more likely one is Barrowell Hill, take two, to stop the sides collapsing on, on wells. So there were deep shaft dug in the ground, or, or some shallow ones, stop the sides collapsing in and protect it from earth and that coming in. They used to drop old barrels down to protect the sides. Um, so common practice to put them on top of each other just to stop the sides dribbling in and everything else. And lining the side of wells with stone or, or brick is a practice known as steening. So people with a surname Steen or, or Steening or things like that, again, it's one of those go back in time and, and probably related to that. And there's Chester in all its glory. Battlewell Hill, in, intake, pumping station, and the works at Borton. Originally, the first reservoir there built to actually, because Chester by the 30s, Wrexham and the other areas, industry was starting to grow. Uh, we'd had a world war. There were murmurs in the 30s, things could kick off again. So there was an explosives factory built in Wrexham Industrial Estate. 
one of the common things that they used to make explosives at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, was phenol. Phenol, when mixed with chlorine, forms TCP. And if you can remember back in, I think it was 84, we altered the flavor of your tap water a little bit. And you had dilute TCP coming through your taps instead of pure, unadulterated tap water. So the problem goes back well into, into the 30s. Phenol was present in the river. So Chester Waterworks at the time uh, spent their biggest sum ever and built this huge reservoir at the time um, called the North and Mid, for obvious reasons, <laughs> facing north that way across into Vickers Cross and Hull. That was to so they could shut off supply from the river in a bad pollution event for up to five days. So the benefits were bankside storage in the event of a bad pollution incident or breakdown or whatever, they now had a whole, five days to a full week storage in that, in that rev, reservoir of partially or untreated water to go through the treatment system. As time's gone on, of course, by the 60s, that wasn't five days storage anymore. So they added the south reservoir at that point. And then in mid-90s, uh, mid 90s, 2000 or so, they added the east reservoir there at the back. So they were back up to about five days storage or, or even longer taking extra precautions to, to uh, protect the people of Chester from, from an outage. So you see they're pretty urban as, as it goes straight away. Closer look at the reservoirs, the south reservoir there, the drain for cleaning. As it comes up, you can still see that uh, the process does allow some silt to build up in the reservoir, so it has to be cleaned out every, every few years. Because the reservoirs hold quite a substantial amount of water in each, they fall under the 1935 Reservoirs Act, uh, because if they were breached, there could be a danger to uh, life and structures, so people living in the back there. Um, these have to be emptied and drained out every 10 years for an, uh, an intermediate. You've heard, probably heard of the Carsington Dam collapse and that. So you, even domestic reservoirs have to be um, fall under regulation. So a specialist panel engineer nominated by the government has to come in and, and uh, they inspect every panel, cast in mark, everything, all the pumps, drain down procedures, overflows. They'll check everything on those reservoirs to make sure structurally we're not posing a, a, a a danger to people living around the, the works itself. And of course, quite a bit of, most of these are underground, as they go deep into the ground as well. But um, yeah, we don't cause a damage. We had an overflow in the new one uh, due to control system failure that actually collapsed that part of the uh, canal wall at one point onto the towpath. Um, so again, we had to put remedial things in and, and, and upgrade the system to stop that happening again. Looked at the Shropshire Uni Union Canal as a potential source of water when uh, the D was uh, under a bit of pressure. Uh, but sadly, uh, the water quality, it's too slow moving. The water quality wasn't good at the time I, I looked at it. Uh, so we, we did abandon that. But nowadays, the, the uh, canal, canal and Rivers Trust are, are selling uh, flows out of the uh, various canals and rivers that we've got to water companies for, for a, a secondary source. So it could, could be treated nowadays as, as the system's improved. Biggest problem in Borton was gulls on these filter beds and, and, and reservoirs. So they were, we tried plastic owls, little bangs, which residents don't like, obviously, uh, and all sorts. But yeah, the, nowadays uh, we've got floating nets and all sorts going on to, uh, to discourage them because we don't want even though it's par only partially treated, we, d we don't want uh, fecal material from birds building up. That's what the south reservoir looks like empty. Uh, so you can see road level round about where the angle is uh, goes up and starts straightening again. Uh, concrete, reinforced concrete structure. That's how we used to clean it. So whoever had upset me that day got the tractor job. <laughs> no, it's an older shot than that. Uh, British tractor, I might add as well. But uh, yeah, basically, waterworks sludge is strange. Uh, it's called fixotropic. 
if you add it to soil and land and that, it, it's, uh, it makes difficult soils more flexible and, uh, and um, can help bind them together. If you start stirring it up like that, it goes very blancmange and jelly-like, which is a good property because we want to suck it out with a pump. So we can actually liquefy it again by uh, going around with a, with a, a tractor at the time, with, a, with a, like a plough type of arrangement on the front. I think it's an even older shot. Uh, yeah, so a simple little plough, stirring it up, and uh, there we go. That was the new reservoir, the east reservoir, built uh, uh, towards Churton Road. So road level, part, part way up at the top of the slope, and that bit on the ground. Because ground conditions there was that bad, uh, we had to have the reservoir designed and constructed like the hull of a boat, because there's a lot of running sand underneath. So if the water level, there's a complex system of drains to make sure the water pressure doesn't build up and pop the reservoir out the ground. Uh, but just in case it sits there and can float on a certain amount of water as well. So a lot of design and things that uh, gets taken uh, in, into these uh, huge structures that, that appear next to uh, residential areas. That top end of Borton Strange as well is about 18 to 19 foot of made up ground. So when the Romans first encountered, they were a good uh, 18 foot, uh, five, six meters below uh, where we are today. So there's, uh, there's a lane there called Chemistry Lane. Uh, the origins of that, they were originally on the side of the canal back in, in the 1700s, there were, it was a small chemical works. So the Grover Museum, Museum were interested when we were excavating, but the only, we, did encounter a very high, they broke the ground one day, McAlpine's the main contractor, and there was a very high spirit type uh, smell, almost like a fuel, but not quite even sharper than that. Uh, so we had to stop the site for a while till it dispersed. But the only thing we ever found were some remnants of, of clay vessels with weird looking interesting glazes on. But I'm not sure what the museum did, if, if they even looked to see what the, uh, there were any shards. So I'm not sure if the museum ever investigated them further. So the or origins of that little lane that says Chemistry Lane uh, was in fact a, a valid little works. The water tower, when it was built in 1854, my battery's running out, but there, the blue tank actually rest, rested on that first parapet. Uh, it was surveyed and designed to meet uh, the higher properties, to give water supply to the uh, properties on Northgate Street. So over time, as, as Chester developed, and believe it or not, within about 30 years, there wasn't enough gravity flow from that tank to supply quite a lot of the new customers coming online in, in parts of Chester. So they actually jacked the tank up in the air. Instead of dismantling it, they jacked it up in the air uh, using hydraulic jacks all the way around built a course of bricks, let them go off, raise the tank, raise the tank. So they built that extra section, which is around about six, seven meters higher to give a gravity supply into the uh, chest at that time. And that was about 1886 they had to do that. I've got uh, somewhere in a collection, I've got, I've got an old print of them testing the uh, firefighting ability for the Chester Cathedral. And uh, the hoses couldn't supply enough to hit the roof at that time. And that's why the city of Chester Waterworks bought their own little horse-drawn fire engine. They couldn't rely on the public supply at that time to uh, fight a fire in the cathedral. So they got funding for that. Yeah, and again, not up on Northgate Street and some of those properties that would have uh, been paying for a, for a private supply at that time. So all this time we've been talking about, you know, Chester was a private, always a private water company formed by Acts of Parliament. So when the big privatisation came along in, in um, 89, um, when the Big Ten were formed and everything else, Chester and about 30 odd other companies were still private, but they were water only. They never treated sewage. The sewage was, at that time was part of the council's remit, uh, medical officer health and everything else. But the Big Ten, when they were formed, you, you know, um, Northwest Water, Welsh Water and all the rest, they did water and sewage. The investment in the 70s was, uh, in the 70s, I should say, when the Big Ten were formed, uh, investment was that poor by councils that the sewage works had collapsed. 
and the state of uh, we hear today that Britain's rivers are, are, are badly polluted and that by the 70s they were septic there was no life left in them uh, it was grim and you believe it or not the river Mersey uh, at Liverpool there were no sewage treatment uh, uh, until the about the 80s when they built the sand and dock converted the sand and dock into massive sewage treatment works sewage was just going directly in the river Nowadays, you get migratory salmon and all sorts of traveling right up towards Manchester, up the Mersey. So big strides, uh, uh, big, big uh, improvements have been made. But things in the 70s got really bad, and that's why the government uh, privatized uh, a lot of the old sewage undertakings and everything else. Some of these other water companies in, into, into the Big Ten. For those of you who know your Hambridge, Hambridge Water Tower, uh, built in the 1930s. So water crossed an 18-inch main under a 450 mil main across the river uh, just above uh, downstream of the Earl's Eye uh, and goes feed, used to feed into the tank at the top and then that used to gravitate down to, uh, to give security of supply down uh, as far as Saltney, Broughton, that way. And a smaller version of it occurred in Upton. Nowadays, there's a more modern reservoir at Piper's Ash that feeds the Upton and Christleton areas by pumps rather than the reservoir supply. Bolton Tower itself. Uh, this is the 1913 um, engine room that was built to take one of the... Um, it was the first DC electric uh, dynamo supply uh, pump an engine in, in, in the UK when, or in England when it was built. The works also had engineers living on site, an engineer's house there, and there was a, uh, the upper works, the lower works down at Battlewell Hill. There was also an engineer lived down there as well. So if the problems, uh, they could respond really quickly. <clears throat> because of the use of chlorine in water supply, that dreaded chemical that formed TCP when the phenol went through, uh, my opinion, by the 1920s, when it was added at Chester and other places, it was one of the greatest contributions to, to public health. So a contentious chemical, but when it was introduced, uh, a lot and lot of stomach ailments and, and disease disappeared overnight because E. coli and things like that were, had no, no resistance to, to chlorine, likes getting rid of them pretty quick. It's only things like viruses and things like that can be a bit more tenacious and require the whole treatment process rather than just disinfection. It's always added at the clean end as well because chlorine uh, also likes chemicals in the water naturally, so naturally occurring organic chemicals, uh, plants rotting, things like that. Chlorine can react and form some other uh, uh, nasties. So yeah, added at the clean end. Used to be a big chimney on the top of it as well when it was steam powered uh, at the back, uh, still, still known on the drawings as the slack yard. The canal barges used to come in drop the, the slack or, or small coal, rough coal off at the back, shoveled into the boilers, and then, uh, yep, steam power, steam engine inside there, and, and one inside the pump, uh, pump house as well. That's one of the boilers. I think that's down at Battle Hill rather than Borton Works. Uh, or a big old Callaway boiler. Big flywheel going in uh, re later replacement in, in the engine house itself. You can see the lovely different coloured uh, coated brick. The 19th century, early part of the 20th century, we were using slow sand filters. Uh, used to, so still to use today to successfully treat the River Thames. The slow sand filter uh, relies on natural bacteria and life growing in the first 25 mil inch of sand and a whole life cycle develops on there. So on top of the sand itself, uh, you can see there being replaced, uh, the sand becomes a living filter. It's like a living carpet of life and all the bacteria that went onto it, and they found in the 19th century this by microscopy, so try saying that after six o'clock, um, the germs weren't passing through. The filter was holding back particles and germs smaller than the gaps between the sand. So they knew something was going on. It wasn't just a natural filtration through sand uh, particles. Something was happening. And it was because the life on top of that filter was devouring the bacteria and viruses. It was always getting trapped on the top. 
So the, I think the British had a grand name for it called the Zuglial layer, where all this life land, uh, grew and landed. The Germans called it the Schmutzdecker. What a great name. So uh, <clears throat> after the First World War, the government uh, granted things like uh, a lot of instruments and that they used in industry to, to support the war effort in, in World War One. Things like little railways and, and sheds and buildings appeared around the waterworks of the country as these items were taken up. So the waterworks had its own narrow gauge railway at one time uh, running around. That was the layup of a slow sand filter, different layers of sand and gravel and, and fil octagonal filter tiles at the back. We all right for time, yep. Still in basin there. Uh, the slow sand filter was getting blocked very quickly with sand and silt. So they built a, uh, what they call a still in basin, a tank where things could settle out. This was built before the, uh, the reservoirs were built at the back of it. There you can see the little sheds and things that the uh, war department donated. Crossing the canal at uh, back of Borton into Hool, one of the water mains was laid across there, so the canal, temporary secession of boating, uh, the clay dug out, the pipe laid, resealed, and, and uh, the canal opened again. <clears throat> you see the sort of depth they go down. If we're digging a hole in the road, the water company always like to get in first because we want to go deeper for frost protection, of course. So uh, we say to the electric and gas, hold on, we get affected, we have to go deeper, we want to put ours in first. Ice, the biggest enemy. Uh, 1963 winter, the ice on top of the slow, fan, slow sand filters grew that thick that uh, water couldn't get through. If you can't get any water through the slow sand filter, it won't go in the clean reservoir and it won't get pumped out. So waterworks staff were that busy with burst mains and problems out in, in the field, in, in uh, residential areas. They had to hire contractors in to keep breaking the ice. So health and safety at its best, rubber wellies on an ice raft, what can go wrong? Uh, yeah, physically breaking the ice and lifting it off. <clears throat> this was all dumped at the little Rudy and uh, lasted at least three months before it melted. Excuse me. <clears throat> and you can see there, huge blocks of ice. 60s, again, uh, almost Arctic ice ridges growing in, in the river. This is at Sandy Lane, one of the last places to uh, freeze in Chester, simply because you've got springs from Walmore Park coming in and uh, water underground is always around about 7 degrees C, uh, so the water's always a bit warmer. And that's why the birds are clever. The fish are fish go there in the winter because it's a bit warmer, a bit more life, plankton, things like that. So the birds obviously follow them. I got my own photograph in 1983, but not quite as impressive. But you see ice flows coming down the river. There was a little supply in the sandstone, an underground water supply at Plemstall, uh, supplying uh, past Mickle Trafford, uh, Dunham Hill, that area. At the moment, I don't think it's in use, but it, it was a... 100 metre, 300 uh, odd feet uh, into the sandstone, into the clean part of the uh, sandstone there, sucking water out and pumping directly into supply with, with a small dose of disinfection. Nature's job of filtering through that rock far, you know, is better than, than we can do. And groundwater is always that bit cleaner, tastes that little bit better because we're, we're using the huge River Dee. It's always going to have that little bit of organic. Uh, but yeah. Groundwater. The only downside to a borehole supply is when you boil the kettle, you're going to get hardness. You're going to get the calcium salts and things coming out. And that's what it looked like when they first built it. An actual artesian well, so the ground pressure is actually squeezing the water out of the little borehole. But again, I think that was even in that dress, I'm pretty sure it was around about the 1930s. And that's all it looks like today. Little little submersible pump right down in, in about 80 or 90 foot down. The water pressure build, brings the rest up in, uh, in a protective sleeve. It's also disinfected by ultraviolet light. Because the water is very clear, UV light can get in and make sure there's no bacteria or viruses present. And again, river at sea, Grosvenor Park, boating, etc. coming on. 
the um, back of the precinct, laying in water mains diversion when the precinct was come. For those of you who know the Plumber's Arms, the reason it was called the Plumber's Arms is the uh, Chester Waterworks main office used to be next door. So uh, when they st the staff knocked off, obviously they were straight in the, uh, in the pub for a pint, so it got known as the, as the Plumber's Arms officially. The Weir, self, self built in Norman times for raising mills and, and grinding corn. Parking usually a problem in Chester, as you can see. Floating coin, uh, there's the water tower, you can see quite visible from there. Uh, early 80s, I think this photograph was, so um, the Leadworks Tower was still there at that point, but come down very shortly after. The electric light, uh, the uh, little power station, hydroelectric power station built uh, on the side of the old D bridge. So just like your bike, the dynamo on, on a bike wheel, the water power just turns a wheel around, generates electricity, and supplied Chester for quite a few years. Opened in 1913, uh, even though we were against it, the water company were against it at the time because they didn't like anything interfering with the River Dee flow, thou shalt not do it, it will affect us badly, they still accepted an invitation. Or perhaps not because I've, got the, uh, I've still got the ticket there that uh, C. Wilfred Bennett maybe didn't hand in. The old Dee Bridge, remnants of the salmon fishing industry, which has sadly disappeared from the Hambridge area now. I think, I'm not sure if there's even a single license left in that area. The Grosvenor Bridge positioned and floating an, uh, a large diameter main in uh, the 1940s to lay across the river to supply uh, the increasing areas uh, towards the lake and around there. 1832, the second crossing of the River Dee, Grosvenor Bridge. Um, built by public subscription and funds from the Duke of Westminster. Uh, it's said one night he was traveling home across the old D bridge and a political party uh, against the, uh, the Duke and his standings tried to tip his carriage into the river. So he vowed not to travel that way again and had the uh, Grosvenor Bridge built. The race course, as you can see, uh, made up ground over the years. Notice it's on the outer curve of the bend, so this is all debris. The river would have been a much tighter curve at one time and cutting across, so this has built up over many, many years. This uh, across towards Curzon Park, if you notice that strange cloud formation. Uh, Chester Waterworks solicitor has an office looking that way over the race course. He rung us up, most concerned, to say, have you got a problem with your water supply? Because most of it seems to be coming out in Curzon Park. And uh, we checked everything, our gauges, no, nothing wrong. It was, in fact, a, a United Utilities main, so we breathed a sigh of relief and then rang them <laughs> to say that you, you're losing quite a bit of water. <laughs> the last stretch of the River Dee turned into a canal to try and keep the uh, shipping industry going as, as long as possible. Uh, you've still got a chain maker's row and places like that, uh, alluding to the industry that used to happen in Saltney. Something else as boring as me, coming up the river, quite an impressive bore coming up the river itself. Uh, obviously not surfable, or, well, I don't know, somebody will probably have a go. And don't forget, this is what most people used to use even up to the 1940s as their public water supply. It'd be wrapped in, in hay bale and, and hessian sacks to stop it freezing up, but a little wooden crack valve in there and somebody pumping away. And this is why chlorine was such so important. People were starting to travel in the 20s and 30s, buses and that, going out into the countryside. People living around that well, the pig farm next to it and everything else, the germs and that going in there. They'd drunk it for years, they were used to it. Their stomach could stand it. People going out into the countryside weren't. And that's it. <laughs> Gosh, uh, thank, thank you, Tim. Uh, we've got a little time for some questions, and uh, my lovely assistant here will uh, get the microphone <laughs> to you so that we can hear you at home. So, uh, any, any questions, please? Is this working? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
first of all, has there been a publicity about the lack of new reservoirs? Is that an issue in the um, I don't think for the, for the River D because the corporations took such an interest. Liverpool Corporation building Alwyn, uh, Welsh Water, some of the others, and direct control over the others. D Valley Water, Chester Water, building the other reservoirs there to give themselves protection. And, and, and in case that there's, there's other issues on the river as well. This area, I think, we're well catered for. In fact, in my memory, we've only had one uh, drought order hosepipe ban. And Chester Waterworks at the time only undertook it because it's politically all the rest had done so. In, in, in reality, we probably didn't need to do a host pipe ban. The rest of the country was blanketing themselves in it. Uh, we're fortunate. Other areas, the southeast of water, uh, southeast area of the country is desperate for it. Uh, yeah, the great, Greater London expansion and everything else, they're, they're going to be in real, it's forecast real trouble in the next 10 years for water supply. We have an environment minister, sad to say, my confidence in, in yeah. Okay, so, so just, just transfer. <laughs> Austerity and, and money moving elsewhere, I think, is, yeah, we're, we're in trouble. In, in areas of the country, we're in trouble. Pardon? Shareholders. shareholders think about as well, yeah, there are big profits, and you're talking uh, the, the CEO of, of um, Seven Trent, who uh, she, she got a salary of getting towards three million plus bonuses in the same figure. I know she's got a big area of supply now, but... Okay, another question here. You mentioned that the uh, river is, well, well as we know, it's, it's uh, tidal. Yes. We've got saline coming up. So presumably you only abstract when it's fresh water coming down. Yes. That's the first thing. Yep. The second question was, is it just chlorine and filtration you're using, or do you use aluminium salts or anything else? To uh, yeah, uh, you're quite right about the, um, the saline intrusion. So salt water can come back up. Uh, the intake or river at that point has a salinity meter, <laughs> for obvious reasons, yeah, we want to know when it's turning. The, st the start is the, the, the ch it's man 24 hours in Borton, simply because of the, the tides. Uh, I think they'd try and get rid of the man in if, if they could overcome that problem safely without risk. But yeah, so we're measuring for saline intrusion. Uh, we measure for, con uh, which is conductivity. Ammonia levels will start to rise because you're in the slower part of the bottom estuary. The sewage works, di uh, drops it back in there. So ammonia levels will rise. Uh, color will change. The, there's cameras on the, on the thing to see the river start to come back. River level rises, so there's a whole sheaf of monitors there uh, duplicated in, in Battlewell pumping station as well. Yeah, it's a whole raft to, to protect it and, and shut it down. And they allow enough going back to, to flush it. So we're off for quite a bit of time each, each tide that tops the weir. Yeah. So, so your part of the question was... Uh, do you add anything other than chlorine? Yeah, the, the main part of the treatment process comes through uh, it's screened. It does have aluminium sulfate uh, that that's, uh, take, binds all the silts and fine material together, and uh, they're all lifted out of the thing by a plant called Dissolved Air Flotation Plant. So it looks like a, a milk chocolate aero factory, and that's skimmed off. Clear the water from underneath, goes round those reservoirs, so you've got five days there where sunlight can, can make a, a difference as well. It then goes through a double set of filters, uh, of which one bank is, is carbon, so it's double filtrated. Uh, they can uh, then chlorinate it, uh, then combined with ammonium sulfate, because that is less aggressive to any unlined pipes. It also doesn't taste as bad as free chlorine on its own, and it combines and forms a more stable chemical than chlorine. Uh, so yeah, it's quite complex, and a lot of testing. They're tested at each stage. Sorry. I think we only have time for one right. more question. So, um, just south of Grosvenor Bridge, Duke's Drive, there's a lot of work done, and a tunnel done, and there's a bit of land fallow just down by the river. Is that water supply, is that sewage? 
Uh, no, I'm not, I'm, uh, I think so, the uh, bottom of Greenaway Street. No, no, on the, on the south side of the river, just south of Grosvenor Bridge. Oh, sorry. Um, as far as I know, it's not Thames, uh, it's not Seven Trent, uh, so I, I'll be honest, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think there are several more questions. <laughs> Did you want one? Yeah, uh, but I think we now have to stop because it's yeah, 10 to 12. I'll, I'll, I can I'm remain sure here, yeah. Tim will be very happy to answer your questions if you go down to the front. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Should we Thanks. give Tim a round of applause? Thank you.